This is a very exciting day for the university and for the College of Medicine. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Eugene Moad. I'm the interim dean for the College of Medicine, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the annual Watonic Unicorn Lecture. Before I introduce this year's lecturer, Dr. Michael Tan, who's going to share a bit of uh, his professional and personal connection to Dr. Watana Kunikorn, I would like to provide a brief background on this lectureship and how it became possible and tell you a bit about the generosity of a family who have been friends to Neomed for many years. Dr. Chachchai Watana Kunikorn was a beloved professor of internal medicine at then neo -UCOM and was the Director of Infectious Diseases at St. Elizabeth Health Center in Youngstown until his passing in 2001. In 2004, the Watana Kunikorn family presented Neomed with a very generous gift as a tribute to his love of medicine and his contributions to medical education. On March 5th, 2004, the family of the late Dr. Chachachai Watana Kunikorn presented Neomed's College of Medicine with, at that time, the largest charitable, charitable gift that we had ever received, $3 million. And to date, Mrs. Watana Kunicorn, and you see her joining us up there, it says Eleanor W. Hello, Eleanor. Um, has more than doubled that gift to more than $6 million. And those additional contributions have allowed us to achieve some wonderful goals. First off, she named this auditorium that you and every student after you can enjoy as you work and as you learn and as you become a health professional. And she also established an endowment that provides funding for this annual lectureship. I'm delighted to say that um, Mrs. Eleanor Watana Kunicorn, and I'm going to call you Dr. Eleanor Watana Kunicorn because a few years ago, Dr. Watana Kunicorn received an honorary degree from Neomed uh, at our commencement. She's joining us virtually from her home in California. Uh, I don't see her picture on the screen, but I certainly know that she can hear us. So please join me in recognizing Mrs. Eleanor Watana Kunicorn with a loud round of applause. Thank you, Eleanor. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would also like to recognize Dr. Ping Zhang, who holds the inaugural Watana Kunicorn Endowed Chair and serves the College of Medicine as a tenured professor in the Integrated Medical Science Department at Neomed. Dr. Zhang. Thank you for joining us. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Dr. Michael Tan, who is a professor of internal medicine and a 1999 graduate of Neomed. Dr. Tan completed his residency training at Summa Health System in Akron, followed by a fellowship in infectious diseases and tropical medicine at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. He serves as the lead physician for the Summa Health Medical Group Infectious Disease Branch at Summa Health, where he is also the clinical professor for infectious diseases and HIV, as well as the medical director for the Summa Health Clinical Research Center and Summa Home Infusion. I'm glad you were able to find time to join us, Mike. He serves as assistant medical director for Summa Care and is chair of Summa Health's Institutional Review Board. In addition to his clinical practice, he is the co-director of the antimicrobial stewardship programs at Summa Health's hospitals and is the elective director for M3 and M4 students, as well as a preceptor for the advanced practice nursing students and physician assistants. He has significant involvement in resident education and has received teaching awards from internal medicine and family medicine residents. Dr. Tan's primary research interests include participation in multi-centered controlled trials of new and novel treatments for Clostridium difficile infection, which is the topic of today's lecture. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Michael Tan. All right, I'm really uh, pleased and honored to, to be asked to come to give this talk. 
Um, this is a little bit out of my usual realm because I tend to do things a little bit more clinical, but this one is actually more of a historical perspective um, and I think will help kind of draw some of the experience of, of, uh, of clinical practice and a little bit of research uh, in the last few years. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do uh, today, and hopefully I can get it all in time, is uh, first to give a few words about Chichaiwo Tana Kunicorn, uh, mostly because I don't want to lose sight of why we have this lecture and how important Dr. Watana Kunicorn was to this institution, um, and also to the field of infectious disease. Uh, and then we're going to talk mostly about C. difficile, uh, and, and a lot of the problems that arise with C. difficile. Uh, and a lot of this, again, is going to be a very historical per perspective. We're going to review a lot of C. difficile treatment, as well as uh, where we've been, where we currently are, and where we likely will be going um, in the coming years. And then we'll wrap up with some thoughts. So Dr. Watana Kunikorn was uh, born in 1935 in Bangkok. Uh, he went to medical school in Thailand, uh, graduating in 1961. He came to the United States in 1962. Uh, he was a fellow in infectious disease at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, from 1966 to 1968, and by 1976, he was a professor of medicine uh, at, at the same institution. Uh, he came up in 19, uh, around 1978-79 uh, as the director of infectious disease at St. E's uh, in Youngstown, along with an acad academic appointment uh, as professor of internal medicine at, at neo UCOM in 1979. And if you can recall, um, the school was established uh, at that time. And he, uh, he died in 2001. So as was mentioned, uh, Dr. Watana Kunukorn actually has a, a, a clinician award named in his honor uh, from the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is given to, annually to an IDSA member or fellow in recognition of outstanding achievement in clinical practice in infectious disease. Uh, he himself had won this award um, in 2000 and subsequently uh, the, the name was, uh, the award was given under his name. So Dr. Watana Kunikorn was very active academically as well as clinically. Uh, when I actually went back and did a PubMed search, putting in just Watana Kunikorn and filtering it down to everything, uh, he had 197 publications. Um, two of them were actually, one or two of them were uh, posthumous. Uh, but if you look at these, these studies, um, most of them deal with staph, Staphylococcus aureus, um, and most of them deal with endocarditis. And there are a lot of things that are just kind of filtering in there. There's a lot there that's also dealing with drugs, uh, including uh, vancomycin. And at the time that all of this was happening, there wasn't a whole lot known about Staph aureus or Staph aureus resistance or vancomycin or resistance uh, with, uh, with all of the different agents or how to deal with endocarditis and how to deal with endocarditis in people who were having uh, various procedures. These publications I've got listed go up to about 1982, and that's just a few select ones, but his publications go all the way through 2001, and again, including 2002, which was after his death. So um, this is actually a uh, photo from 1970 from the Division of Infectious Diseases at uh, the University of Cincinnati. And Dr. Watana Kunikorn is up here, it's the red button, right? Right here. Uh, this good looking guy here is actually my dad who was, uh, was in the same department at the time. And then this is actually a little bit later. I don't actually know the context. All I know is it looks like some sort of meeting because they're wearing name tags. Um, and here's my dad, there's Dr. Watana Kunikorn. Um, I actually had the opportunity to travel with him in um, and the Watana Kunikorn family in 1988. Uh, and this was on a Sino-American uh, medical uh, tour that was through Beijing and Shanghai and different parts of China. And I don't know who these two guys are, uh, but the, there's uh, Chichai and, uh, and Eleanor um, as we're awaiting lunch or dinner or something. And then of course, uh, this was actually the entire uh, group on this trip. and. Uh, so here you can see Dr. Watana Kunikorn. There's my dad. Um, here's my mom, who's actually sitting over here, and uh, Eleanor. And if you actually peer back here, you can see um, uh, a 15-year-old me. OK. Oh, I forgot I put this one in here, too. So uh, this was in Cincinnati, and this is my mom and, uh, and Eleanor. OK, so let's talk a little bit about C. difficile. Um, 
It is now known as Clostridioides difficile. It was previously known as uh, Clostridium difficile, but in, in reality, everybody still just calls it C. diff. Uh, it is responsible for C. diff associated disease. Uh, or C. dad, sometimes also referred to as C. diff associated diarrhea, C. diff colitis, or C. diff infection, or CDI. And this is an anaerobic spore forming gram positive bacillus. Uh, it makes toxin, which makes it uh, a bit dangerous. And uh, it was actually first described in 1935 by Hall and O'Toole. And uh, it was actually described as intestinal flora found in the feces of newborn infants with this description of uh, as a new pathogenic anaerobe. Now in 1937, um, Snyder actually reviewed the, uh, the data for Hall and O'Toole, and in their paper, in his paper, said the most remarkable property of this anaerobe was its pathogenicity. Cultures or filtrates caused marked edema in subcutaneous tissues of guinea pigs and rabbits, and convulsions in guinea pigs similar to those of tetanus. So the photos that you see here are actually um, uh, microscopic uh, photos of, uh, of what was then known as Bacillus difficilis. Um, and as you'll see in some subsequent pictures that I have, it's, this is uh, essentially uh, C. difficile, but this is the first reporting of, uh, of the organism. So this is actually from, uh, from CDC public domain photo. This is uh, what C. difficile looks like under a microscope. Uh, this is what it looks like on the, uh, on the electron. And uh, this is what it looks like growing out on a plate with those nice golden colonies uh, being uh, C. difficile. And if we go a little bit deeper and look more toward the genetics of it, the things that make C. difficile unique are these coding regions. They're uh, broken down in TCD A, B, C, and D, where A and B make uh, code for the toxin production, and then TCD C is a negative regulator, and the TCD D is that positive regulator. And it's these variations of these of that, of that PA locus that affect what you actually have with C. difficile. So if we look at the, the toxins that are made, there's toxin A, there's toxin B, and binary toxin. What's interesting is that toxin A classically has been known as what causes problems with patients with C. difficile. But in more recent years, since the epidemic strain of C. diff has come around, we've actually learned that toxin B is actually more damaging than toxin A. And we also know that, toxin, that binary toxin is made in very high levels in epidemic strain, but we don't actually know what it does because, uh, because if you take hamsters that are infected with this epidemic strain of C. diff uh, with uh, binary toxin, but they don't have toxin A or B, that they don't actually um, cause cell damage, but they do cause a lot of fluid secretion. So if you vary that PA locus, you get 34 different types of uh, toxinotypes with the classic being toxinotype zero or A positive, B positive. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that epidemic strain, which is also known as toxinotype uh, three pulse field gel electrophoresis NAP1 ribotype PCR 027, which I tell people just refer to it as the epidemic strain. And what we have with that is because there is a lack of that negative regulator, there is much more production of toxin A and toxin B, and it tends to be a much more severe disease. So if we look at the overall life cycle of C. difficile, uh, there are really only a few things that, you could, that are important, at least from my standpoint. C. difficile comes essentially in a vegetative form and a spore form. The vegetative form tends to be very susceptible to antibiotic, the spore form is not. The vegetative form makes toxin. So oftentimes what happens with C. difficile is you treat it, you kill off all the vegetative, which helps, but then you've got spores that are still there. Those can become vegetative, you get toxin, you get a recurrence. That's one of the problems that we have with C. difficile. And it, up to right now, the only way that we have to affect how we deal with C. diff is to kill vegetative form. So how do we deal with everything else? Okay. C. difficile causes a clinical disease that you're probably aware of, generally causes a liquid stool seven to 10 times a day. This is the best thing to talk about when I have people eating in front of me. Um, and, but for the purposes of research or clinical practice, uh, generally the definition is more than three unformed bowel movements uh, a day without having another reason. Um, though in real world, it's really a lot more explosive than just three times. And as we had mentioned, it typically has a recurrence that is very high, 
upwards of 20 to 30 percent for a first timer with C. difficile. So even if you do everything properly, even if the patient takes the medication properly, they're still very likely to get a recurrence. So we have to figure out how to deal with that. It's often associated with antimicrobial use, but it also can come from direct exposure and it can lead to toxic megacolon. It can lead to people losing their colons as a result of it. And it can also lead to death. Um, and it is a very, very common cause of hospital acquired infections. So as we kind of had mentioned, there are lots of challenges. One is diagnosis. Why? Because the testing, while it's the testing uh, sounds great, it's not that accurate. It's not that specific because we don't oftentimes consider all of the clinical factors that need to go into determining whether or not we're truly dealing with C. difficile. Recurrence we mentioned. Treatment is difficult um, because of uh, the various drugs that have been out and are coming out. The stigma of it. Okay, if you have somebody who's in the hospital with C. difficile and they're in isolation, people don't like to go into isolation rooms. So food doesn't get delivered. Patients don't get seen because people don't want to get gowned up. And then cost. And it's not just the cost of the hospitalization, but it's subsequent hospitalizations. Cost of all the testing, cost of all the, of all the PPE. And again, uh, challenges of C. diff testing is that oftentimes that testing is not necessarily representative of true disease. So I have this slide in here really just to kind of reemphasize that I, we, you know, you, you deal with a lot of things clinically, but then you also have to deal with some of the, um, uh, the other aspects of medicine. And one of the things that we deal with is that when you deal with C. difficile as a hospital acquired infection, your hospitals can be penalized if you have more C. diff cases than you should. Okay, so as such, there are metrics to deal with. And you can try to deal with the metrics by taking care of the problem, but you can also deal with metrics by playing a little game of how do you make things work in your favor. So in our situation, we've actually, um, and the IDSA has actually developed different methods to say you should test this way so that you can minimize how you report what might be construed as a hospital acquired C. diff case. Because those things are oftentimes based only on a lab number or a lab result, not necessarily on what a clinical, uh, what a clinical uh, situation is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of C. difficile. The first description of it was actually 1893 as a pseudomembranous colitis that was described as a diphtheritic colitis. We mentioned Hall and O'Toole in 1935. Interestingly, through the 50s though, this type of colitis was actually attributed to Staph aureus. And in most things that I'm gonna show you, it was actually just referred to as uh, post-operative or oftentimes just pseudomembranous colitis without necessarily knowing what was cause, causing it. There was a lot of description of it has to be caused by a toxin. And using antitoxin to uh, Clostridium sordelli actually was noted to neutralize the effect of uh, or the effects of, of this type of colitis. But it wasn't until 1978 that C. difficile was actually uh, that they made the connection and said, this looks just like um, the uh, looks just like uh, those patients who have pseudomembranous colitis that are neutralized with the Sordelli antitoxin, and then they made the connection, and that was actually based on a case series of I think it was like eleven or fourteen patients. It was not that many. So in 1978 and on, uh, you were looking at vancomycin and metronidazole as being potential uh, treatments for C. difficile uh, because of their known action. 1995, we see our first guidelines that are actually published as to how to treat C. difficile infection. Interestingly, uh, as we'll come around uh, in the 2000s, Staph aureus came back into the picture because there were a lot of people who were being treated with one particular drug that was not actually treating Staph aureus. And so people had to say, okay, maybe there's actually something there, we're coming back full circle. And then there was a guideline update in 2010 the first new antimicrobial to treat C. difficile comes in 2011, 43 years after re-identification of C. difficile. And then guideline updates in 1821, and, uh, and we're gonna talk about some new things in 2022. All right, so let's start going back into history. Now I'll tell you one of the most fun things about doing this was actually going back and going into primary literature. Um, I also did learn that um, nobody goes to the library and gets thing, journals out and actually stands by a copier anymore. So a lot of these things I had to, to, um, 
to actually find and get PDF'd in some way or another. But this is the first description of pseudomembranous colitis, enterocolitis, and a relationship with antibiotics. So pseudomembranous colitis has been out there, but in this document, uh, uh, Dr. Newman actually said, you know what, all of these patients that I'm describing have been exposed to antimicrobials. And I think that's important for a few reasons. So he said in this one, uh, it's, uh, over the last several years, there have been an impaired increase in the incidence of pseudomembranous colitis. Disagreement has existed uh, regarding the role of antibiotics and its etiology for this condition. Now, if we go to the next page, uh, there's actually some things here that we'll read through. Uh, and uh, in that second one to the right there, I basically, uh, where I, there are a few things that I like to, to point out. Um, it is likely that if more cultures had been taken using median conditions likely to demonstrate pathogenic staphylococci, more proved cases of staph enteritis would have been diagnosed. Okay, so this is referring to staph aureus as being the cause of pseudomembranous colitis. But then I think the other things that I really like are the phrases, when one contemplates the use of an antibiotic, if time permits, isolation and identification of organism with its sensitivities are important. And also in the next one uh, phrase, since the duration of use and dosage of antibiotics are directly proportional, proportional to the development of pseudomembranous enterocolitis, one may conclude that the smallest acceptable dosage should be used and only for that period deemed necessary and suspicion should immediately be aroused by longer use or larger dose. And these are great to me because these really speak to antimicrobial stewardship, which has really come to being in the last seven to 10 years. It was there to begin with. It's just that it really got swept behind because everybody was just trying to kill everything uh, with antibiotics. Okay, so vancomycin was really the first majorly uh, accepted treatment for C. difficile. Interestingly though, before, uh, prior to identification of C. difficile as the, uh, uh, the cause of pseudomembranous colitis, treatment with antibiotics was not actually, was not usually necessary. And most cases of pseudomembranous colitis resolved following the withdrawal of antimicrobial therapy. Akeley and Tedesco in 1978, working at opposite ends of this, actually uh, described the use of vancomycin uh, for pseudomembranous colitis and postoperative diarrhea. And again, at this point, we didn't really know, um, uh, we were just coming into knowing that uh, C. difficile was actually the cause of pseudomembranous colitis. So uh, Kaylee described 44 patients who received vancomycin uh, versus placebo. Okay, so I think this is actually special because this is actually a placebo controlled um, uh, uh, study. Um, they refer to toxin strain overgrowth. They know that vancomycin has poor absorption into the gut when treating staph aureus colitis. They know that metronidazole works against C. difficile, but that the colonic levels tend not to be very good because it get a, gets absorbed before it ever makes it back to the colon. Um, and that they found that uh, most of these patients had very good toxin clearance with the use of vancomycin. Tedesco uh, documented a lot of the same things uh, but this was actually focused on nine patients who had pseudomembranous uh, colitis, who were off antimicrobials for anywhere from 10 to eight weeks, 10 days to eight weeks, with resolution of high dose, what we would consider to be higher dose vancomycin at 500 milligrams every six hours for at least a week. And none of these patients were actually documented uh, to have recurrence. But what we'll find is that not a lot of these, patient, these studies actually have a lot of um, uh, patients in them. So these are just the results of, uh, from the Keeley data. And basically what you can see here is that uh, with vancomycin, uh, there is resolution of, of disease as well as resolution of the titers of the toxin uh, found in the feces. And then for Tedesco, showing a lot of the same things, but in this case, also demonstrating antimicrobials that were incriminated in causing uh, the, the colitis as well as uh, the reduction in the toxin titer after initiation of vancomycin. Now, one of the problems with vancomycin though is that uh, you have the opportunity uh, for something that we don't like, which is vancomycin resistance uh, and namely VRE. And also vancomycin has never really been all that cheap. So uh, there were a lot of, uh, and since we knew that metronidazole looked like it was effective, 
there was really a push to say, maybe we should be using metronidazole to treat C. difficile. And this study from Cherry and colleagues uh, looked at metronidazole as an alternative therapy for antibiotic-associated colitis. And this looked at 13 cases of pseudomembranous colitis that were positive by either biopsy or toxin. And what they said was the response to metronidazole treatment compares favorably with that obtained by vancomycin. Okay, this is great. But as you go through these things, you know, I think we do a lot more to scrutinize studies. And if you go back and look at journal articles from 50s, 60s, 70s, people put together case reports. They've got all sorts of data. Some of it's good, some's not so good. This looks pretty good. But you'll notice that this is really nothing more than a case series of 13 patients. There's nothing randomized. There's no control, uh, nothing here. Um, and and uh, the, nothing's blinded. But what you do have is people who did respond to uh, metronidazole, the drugs that were used that induced C. difficile, um, and then the response to metronidazole overall of whether or not there was relapse. Now, Teasley actually went a little bit further than that in 1983, and they actually randomized metronidazole versus vancomycin for C. difficile colitis. And if you look at the doses, they're not things that we use standard right now for C. diff. Metronidazole at 250Q6, vancomycin at 500Q6, so low for metro, high for vanco, but look at the cost difference at the time. Metronidazole was $1,180, I'm sorry, $11.84 for a course. Vancomycin was anywhere from $387 to $520 for a course. Okay, so that was a really big difference. But what you see here is that there really isn't a difference in their study about the response to therapy with vancomycin uh, versus metronidazole. And again, uh, this is just kind of following uh, that up as far as symptoms. And, uh, and what that led to though, uh, was really the, the development of that first paper in 1995 as a guideline for how to treat C. difficile uh, colitis. And so this was published in, uh, by Gerding et al. In, uh, in a Shea position paper, that's the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology in America. And what they suggested there, number one, a few methods to diagnose C. diff by endoscopy that showed pseudomembranes, stool cytotoxin testing uh, for toxin B, EIA for toxin A or B, or a culture with C. difficile with confirmatory testing for toxicity. They also put out guidelines for potential prevention, gloves being very proven, hand washing being eh, probably, antimicrobials, proven, stewardship that gets lost again. And then prophylactic therapy might be helpful, but there's not a lot of data on it. Now, again, this is good because there is a guideline, but it's really interesting when you look back to see how guidelines are applied 30 years ago as opposed to now and how guideline, uh, how good the quality of evidence is that actually get contributed to guidelines. And I would actually bet that if you actually took the things that were used to put these guidelines together, if you use them today, they would all be grade C3, which is bad. Okay. <laughs> all right. So in that, in that position statement, uh, there were a few things that they said that I think are important. One, that C. difficile will resolve in about a quarter of patients within two to three days of discontinuing the offending antimicrobial. They made a recommendation for metronidazole or vancomycin for 10 days. However, they said that metronidazole may be preferred because of that vancomycin resistance risk. We didn't want to see vanco-resistant enterococcus. And they also suggested that we should treat recurrences like the first recurrence. So if somebody has C. diff and it happens again, treat them the same way. There was no data to support using prophylaxis with probiotics, so no uh, recommendations were made. And again, it functionally placed metronidazole ahead of oral vancomycin. Okay, this is actually their summary of, of uh, comparative trials. And actually, again, there's not a lot of, there are not a lot of data. And the regimens that are used are not typical of the things that we use, not necessarily, uh, both for dosages as well as durations. Uh, but I would note here that cholestepol is here as a binding agent. It didn't work all that well. This is the grade of evidence. And what they wanted to say here was again, number one, if you stop the antibiotic, sometimes it got better. It doesn't really happen that way in 2023. Uh, point number three there, if you treat asymptomatic, you should not treat asymptomatic patients with C. difficile, and that Metro and Vanco, while recommended for 10 days, is still B1 evidence, which is pretty good, but it's not fantastic. Okay, that brings us up to the late 90s, early 2000s, and something came around at that time in Montreal called the epidemic strain of C. diff. At this time, 
there were a lot of people who were getting hospitalized. There were a lot of people who were losing their colons because they just couldn't treat the C. difficile. And there were a lot of deaths. Mortality went up by like 10% in people who had pseudomembranous colitis uh, during uh, the epidemic strain uh, of C. diff uh, in Montreal. And that thing has made its all way down to the states. And right now, I th we think accounts for about 40 to 45% of all cases of C. difficile. And again, uh, causes more severe disease. Um, but um, there was also a thought that Staph aureus could be causing more of the pseudomembranous colitis than we previously thought. Why? Because everybody was going to metronidazole. And then it was found and published in several papers and abstracts that people who were failing metronidazole were getting better when you gave them oral vancomycin. And a lot of those people had culturable staph aureus. So we kind of came back full circle to uh, looking at a pathogen that we kind of forgot about and said, okay, we need to be thinking about that too. Of course, it being difficult because staph aureus oftentimes lives in the stool without necessarily causing disease. But what this did is it really made it necessary to look for other agents that would be helpful in dealing with recurrence. And I'm gonna pull this one up here just to give a little bit of background because we're gonna talk about it in a couple slides. But one of the things that came up was a toxin binder. And uh, they thought, uh, the researchers thought that it would be better if you used a binder because it would be safer for preservation of gut flora. Okay, so this is the first time that we're really coming out in research and saying, okay, maybe if we preserve the gut flora uh, and we do less damage, then maybe we won't necessarily need to uh, deal with the recurrences. We'll have less antibiotic pressure uh, to lead to alteration of the gut flora. But we knew that other binders didn't necessarily work. So in this one, this is GT160246, which is also known as televimer. Um, this was actually the first study after I came back from fellowship, the first study that I participated in as a principal investigator for the site, um, where we looked at this agent uh, as part of a multi-centered clinical trial of whether or not this binder would help treat patients with C. difficile or prevent uh, patients from having recurrence. And if you look at these two, uh, two graphs, you can see that on the le left, there's televimer, on the right, there's metronidazole and the survival rate. And what's shown here looks really compelling, that those patients who subjects who received televimer tended to have better survival than those patients who had metronidazole. Okay, so that goes on the study. We'll come back to this. In 2007, Zara and colleagues actually did a comparison of vancomycin and metronidazole for the treatment of uh, C. difficile. But in this case, they also looked at severity of C. difficile. Because again, you can have patients who are pooping 10 to 20 times a day, but you can have patients who have stool like five times a day. You can have people who are, quote, septic, hypotensive, maybe in the intensive care unit, but you can also have patients who are not uh, very sick at all. And in this, uh, this study is important because what it shows is that yes, there is response to metronidazole and yes, there is response to vancomycin. But what it also shows is that patients who were uh, more severe disease tended to do better when they received vancomycin. And then if we go a little bit further, the registration trial for televimer, which we had just mentioned, data published in 2014, but was available much before this, looked at vancomycin versus metronidazole versus televimer because it was a study across three arms. And what this showed was that televimer didn't do anything. It did not come to endpoints. It never came to market. It might look, have looked to do something to help prevent recurrence, but it just didn't do anything good. So bad for televimer. But what it did was it demonstrated that vancomycin was better for severe disease and metronidazole was not as good for severe disease. And these, thing, these two things put together led to the guideline change in 2010 uh, by the IDSA and Shea that said, okay, we're gonna treat, but you need to stratify by how severe your patient is, okay? And that's where the recommendation came in to say metronidazole for mild disease, vancomycin for severe disease. Note that it's 10 to 14 days. That's going to change. This guideline made no mention of what's the best diagnostic test to use. Why? 
because we still didn't know what was the best test to use. It doesn't make any mention of probiotics and it doesn't really make any endorsement or address uh, the use of fecal microbiota transplant. It, notably, this was published very soon before fidaxomycin was released. So there was no endorsement of fidaxomycin. And I will tell you that that made the people who made fidaxomycin very upset. Okay, so that brings me to fidaxomycin which was the second big trial that I got to participate in as a site PI. And this actually makes me happier because fidaxomycin actually turned out to be a very good drug. First data was published, the data were published in the New England Journal in 2011, looking at 10 days of fidaxomycin versus vancomycin. And what they showed in this trial was that there were similar cure rates compared with vancomycin, but that the, uh, the recurrence rate tended to be less with fidaxomycin and that the recurrence rate was also less at 28 days with fidaxomycin. Interestingly, if we teased out the epidemic strain, that recurrence benefit was not necessarily there. But we knew that for first timers, uh, all comers and first timers, that fidaxomycin actually did a better job of preventing recurrence than vancomycin did. Um, there was also a follow up study from the same data that looked at first recurrences. So people who had failed whatever treatment came in for a first recurrence. And in that study, that also showed that people who received fidaxomycin instead of vancomycin or metronidazole did better as from a recurrence standpoint. So we knew that for first timers or first recurrence, fidaxomycin was probably better at uh, preventing recurrence. Why does all of that happen? Um, this is just the data, I'm gonna skip over that. Why does that happen? We think that happens because fidaxomycin tends to be much more targeted towards C. difficile. It tends not to compromise the rest of the gut flora. So you've got gut flora that can help outcompete uh, C. difficile and help prevent it from uh, flourishing and causing toxin and, and, uh, and, and recurrent disease. The problem with fidaxomycin though was that when it came out, it was about $2,000 for a 10 day course. So nobody really wanted to use it up front because it costs a lot of money. But you have to think about it also as, what about the downstream effects? If you prevent a recurrence, you're also pre preventing a hospitalization. You might be saving costs on the back end. You might be saving adverse effects of having multiple courses of C. difficile disease. I'm going to bring up FMT now fecal microbiota transfer, because this factors into the thinking of what needs to happen. So FMT uh, was described uh, several times, but I like to pull this one out as one of the first descriptions uh, for use for the treatment of pseudomembranous colitis. So this was Eisenman and colleagues in 1958. Fecal enema is an adjunct in treatment of uh, pseudomembranous enter enterocolitis. In this case, they're looking at four cases of pseudomembranous colitis caused by micrococcus pyogenes aka Staph aureus. So at this point, we still don't know that it's C. difficile. And they documented successful treatment with fecal retention enema. Again, this is all observational, it's anecdotal. And the, this was used as treatment, not as bowel flora restoration. Schwann and colleagues in 1983 published that relapsing C. difficile enterocolitis could be cured by rectal infusion of homologous feces. This was a single ca case of a patient who had failed C. difficile treatment multiple times with vancomycin with recurrence happening two to three weeks after every treatment discontinuation. So there was one treatment, four recurrences, patient had colectomy, patient had recurrence, patient was treated again. Ultimately, they got donor feces from the patient's spouse, gave her two enemas and she had no recurrences after nine months, okay? So it's not really a controlled trial. It's just a report. What do you do with that? We can't say a whole lot. As we're going through this C. C difficile endemic strain pandemic, epidemic strain pandemic, um, there, you're looking for lots of different things to do. And the big one is maybe we should be considering FMT. Bakken and colleagues actually put out a protocol in 2011. And um, this is good because you need a protocol when you're dealing with something that is considered to be controversial, uh, like fecal transplant. They outlined inclusion exclusion criteria. They outlined how you should test donor stool and possible transmissible agents from giving stool from one patient to another. They talked about preparation and administration, but 
the problem is, this is really a, a document of what we think is the best thing for you to do and the best way to accomplish it. But it wasn't really based on any randomized controlled trials. So do you do something that really doesn't have the data to back it up? Um, and also, since there was a guideline as to how to do it, that meant that there were lots of other permutations of how it actually got done. Okay, you had people who were filtering stool down to a very pure product. You had people who were basically taking stool, running it through the blender, and then putting it down in NG2. Okay, so really not standardized, not aesthetically the best thing to do. In 2013, though, there was a randomized trial that actually came out. And people love to talk about this trial um, because it was the first one that actually uh, put out some randomized data. And they were looking at a 10-week diarrhea-free period, vancomycin versus vancomycin versus vancomycin with bowel lavage and an FMT. And basically it showed that the, those patients who re received FMT had much better cure rates. Now, I have problems with this data because there are only 43 patients in the trial. So it's really hard to come to a good conclusion. The arms are not quite identical as far as how they did the vancomycin. And granted, it's probably not the easiest thing to do. This is not blinded. I have not conceived of how you can do a blinded FMT trial yet, but this is, uh, this is not blinded. So this is the data. It looks really compelling. I actually think that the more important thing is actually buried in figure three, which is that it, this shows that it is possible to make a recipient's gut look like the donor's gut after the FMT. And that had been duplicated in multiple trials um, over and over. So uh, I talked about the limitations. FMT, people were very excited about it, but the drawback was it's not FDA approved. Nobody pays for it, so it was cash-based. If you did FMT, it was great for you because you could charge cash and actually get money for it. Um, and uh, since it's not approved, the FDA actually said, you need to, to uh, file an investigational new drug app to do it. But nobody does that for individual patients. So, and they made all big stink about it and said, hey, there are people who benefit from it. And the FDA said, okay, you don't have to file an IND. We won't enforce it, but you do need to make sure that you get an informed consent saying that it's an investigational product. Um, and IDSA uh, recommends FMT for multiple recurrent disease, and that's for restorative therapy not for treatment. But this gets taken uh, a few steps further every year. And in 2013, uh, Tom Louie, who is a, a colleague in, in Calgary, actually uh, uh, put out this uh, abstract that basically said that it was possible to accomplish FMT by swallowing a large number of pills that had fecal bacteria that were thought to be important in accomplishing FMT. Drawback, it's also not blinded but it looks like it works. And then in 2014, a lab out of New England actually had something very similar with frozen fecal microbiota capsules. Uh, I like to call them the poopsicles uh, or the poopules. Um, and this also looked like it was effective, but also non-blinded. So we've come to a point where there are research studies looking at doing fecal material that's encapsulated, fecal material that's uh, the bacteria that are encapsulated um, and given in a more palatable way but we still don't know anything about the long-term adverse effects, the potential metabolic issues of introducing a new gut biome, as well as uh, the overall long-term safety. There was a company, there is a company called Open Biome that actually tried to help with this by actually having, a, um, uh, having donor stool, screening the stool and making it available for uh, FMT, either from above or below, uh, but again, it is still a research product. You needed an IND to do it. Um, and of course, there are a lot of details with FMT uh, that we really had difficulty working out uh, when doing it from site to site, both legal and logistical. Like who pays for the labs to screen the stool that's going to be infused? Do you have to use a new blender every time you have a different patient? Do you do it under the hood? Do you store your fecal product in the pharmacy next to your warfarin? I don't know, okay? Um, so the most important thing though is we need to think of this not being as a primary C. diff therapy, but rather as bowel flora restoration. 
And then there was another compound that actually came out um, known as bezlotoximab. And this was actually exciting. This was another trial that we got to participate in. And this actually looked at using monoclonal antibody to neutralize toxin. And the first study that came out, uh, the phase two data came out, showed that if you used metronidazole or vancomycin combined with standard of care therapy, that you could reduce the recurrence by about 70%. This actually came to market um, in uh, 2016, uh, 2016, 2017, and basically got approved as a single antibody effusion to be infused after, I'm sorry, during a course of uh, C. difficile therapy. And what this data showed were that you didn't actually cure C. difficile any better with bezlotoximab. But what you did, definitely did do was reduce the recurrence for people who received bezlotoximab. Down from the published here, 27% to 17%, 26% versus 16%. Consistent across two uh, studies. And it looked like it was more effective in patients who were immune compromised, had severe disease, had underlying illnesses, or if they had multiple risk factors. Okay. Drawback, about $3,500. So if we take that $3,500, mix it in with our $2,000 for fidaxomycin, again, it becomes a bit unpalatable. So we have two new agents that haven't been considered by the guidelines. And in 2017, new guidelines came out. And what they did in that, those guidelines were, we actually had better testing available, meaning PCR was available. So a stepped approach to diagnostics came up. But again, trying to maximize pretest probability and recognizing that a lot of people just test because they like to rely on tests. It also refers to FMT for the first time as a treatment for a uh, possible treatment for multiply recurrent disease. It moves fidaxomycin and vancomycin to the same level. That was big, except that then you still have to consider the cost differences. It moved metronidazole down to acceptable alternative if there were barriers to acquisition. And they made recommendations for pediatrics. So, these were the recommendations for treatment. You can see there's a variation here in the quality of evidence. Some of it is strong recommendation with high quality evidence. It goes all the way down to weak and low because we really don't know what to do. Telling you that a lot of guidelines are based on just expert opinion, okay? And then in 2021, okay, noting that bezlotoximab was not on the 2017 guidelines that came out right after bezlotoximab was approved in 2016, uh, there was a focus guideline update. And this was specifically to address only the antimicrobials used to treat C. difficile. And because vidaxamycin was noted to have much better recurrence rates as compared with vancomycin, vidaxamycin was elevated to be the preferred agent to treat C. difficile, okay? And it moved vancomycin actually to an alternative agent. Metro, an alternative agent, if nothing else was available. Bezlo mentioned as an adjunct for recurrence, for first recurrence or subsequent recurrences, and FMT added as a recommendation for patients who have had more than two recurrences or three episodes. And there are the recommendations there, which I'm not going to uh, belabor the point on. So what about probiotics, prophylaxis, I just want to say that there really hasn't been demonstrated anything as far as prophylaxis to help prevent C. difficile, other than maybe more judicious use of antibiotics, as they had mentioned in 1950, okay, that we're just now getting back to. There also haven't good, been good randomized clinical trials about probiotic, but the problem with that is probably not having something standardized and also not necessarily having the data and not knowing what was really best to put back into the gut to be effective. So I wanna go back now to fecal transplant because everybody likes to talk about fecal transplant. First thing, SCR109. This is actually another compound that we got to participate in. And this is an investigational microbiome therapeutic composed of purified firmicute spores. Basically, I will say this is cultivated firmicutes 
to help repopulate the gut flora. Randomized double-blind clinical uh, placebo-controlled trial, three or more episodes of C. difficile compared with placebo or standard of care therapy, and then with 182 patients enrolled, they found a recurrence rate with SCR109 at 12%, 40% with placebo. You're probably wondering why are the numbers so much higher than that 20 to 30% I could keep talking about. It's because you just need unformed bowel movements more than three times a day to call something a clinical failure when you're dealing with research. Not necessarily the same as how you would deal with something clinically. Recurrence was also really low if you used SER109 in combination with fidaxomycin. Safety, similar to placebo. And SER109 is currently an FDA review, probably looking at um, uh, approval later this month or next month. Um, what's important here is that we're getting to a point where we actually are having data using FMT compounds to actually accomplish what we were trying to accomplish. This is the data. Uh, these are the data looking at SCR109 versus, uh, versus placebo. And you can see the sustained clinical response is really good. Recurrence is really good. Uh, recurrence in the overall population is better. Uh, this looks at the amount of uh, SCR109 firmicutes that actually engraft in the microbiome. And it, once it goes there, it looks like it stays there. Okay? And then they also assess quality of life because that's important with research these days too. And basically patients who were treated with SCR109 in addition to standard of care therapy tended to have better quality of life by eight weeks. And then that also brings us to RBX2660. This is an investigational live biotherapeutic compound that consists of a broad consortium of live microbes prepared from human stool collected rigorously from rigorously screened healthy donors. What does this translate to? This is actual fecal product from healthy donors that has been screened and purified to be administered as an FMT compound without all of the things that we are worried about. Uh, by doing FMT without that previous data. And the results from this randomized placebo-controlled trial for RBX2660 showed uh, that patients, this is actually the first part of the trial, but interestingly what it showed was that one dose was better than two dose, doses, and, it all, and one dose was better than placebo. The follow-up data to that basically showed the same thing because people were like, well, why would one dose be better than two doses? But they followed, looked at it, they followed it up, they thought it might've been study design. Ultimately, one dose was better than two doses. And if you look at the safety and efficacy across the data, basically those patients who received um, RBX2660 were much less likely to have recurrence compared to placebo, okay? So now we actually have data on the controversial FMT but using something that is a lot more, uh, that would be considered to be safe uh, and more palatable. And this actually looks at the treatment success rates. You can see it ranges between about 60 to 70%, uh, percent, depending on whether you're using placebo or, um, or the uh, study compound. So RBX2660 has actually received FDA approval as of the end of November. It is, the, it is uh, classified as fecal microbiota live um, since it doesn't actually have a drug class, except for fecal microbiota live. And it, uh, it indication is for prevention of recurrent Clostridioides difficile infection in a single 150 cc enema administered 24 to 72 hours after the last dose of antibiotic that's, that's uh, effective for C. diff. Why is it that way? Because you don't want to kill off all the fecal microbiota with your treatment for C. difficile. Most of the adverse effects were GI related, abdominal pain, diarrhea, distension. Uh, flatulence and nausea. And again, we have to remember it is not a primary treatment uh, for C. difficile infection. All right, so that brings me to unanswered questions. There are always gonna be unanswered questions. And undoubtedly, we have to have another guideline revision that's gonna address one or, one or more newly re, uh, approved FMT products in RBX 2660 or series 109. Hopefully, we'll actually see that in medicine, this guideline revision will be the start of other guideline revisions that we've seen in the last few years, namely with COVID-19, where we actually had revisions of what to do on a more active basis. 
I mean, we were seeing changes on a daily, every other day uh, basis with COVID. With hepatitis C, we were seeing guideline revisions every few weeks as new agents came out. So we should be addressing these faster. Are we likely to see an oral preparation? Probably, and hopefully, because I think people, no matter how you slice it, you say, well, I wanna give you an enema to help present, prevent something, people are gonna be like, oh, I don't wanna deal with that. RBX may come out, come out as uh, PO. There needs to be more study on that uh, series. The approval, hopefully, that they're working on uh, will be by PO. But again, compounds are just a little bit different. Will there be more adverse effects associated with FM FMT? We'll find out in time. Over after the uh, registration trials, when people start using it, and there are lots of numbers, we'll learn more about it. Will it eliminate the need for a pre-labeled pre FMT, like open biome? We don't know. This is the only approved uh, way to do it right now. And will it affect that open biome initiative? And will FMT lead to recommendation for multi-stage treatment? Will it actually say, you should give an antimicrobial and follow it up with monoclonal antibody? Or it may say, you should follow it up with, um, uh, with uh, fecal microbiota transfer, okay? Or maybe a combination of both. Maybe it will be that plus a stratification. So I'm gonna leave you with a few take-home points. Um, and that is, uh, one, treatment is never as straightforward as you think it will be. The more you learn about something, the more you learn that you actually don't know anything about it, and that with everything that's left, everything can be wrapped into another permutation that nobody's gonna understand. You can always find an exception in something that doesn't follow the rules. You need to know what you're treating to be most effective and know the consequences, okay? We didn't really start making a lot of strides with C. difficile therapy until we realized that it was C. difficile causing pseudomembranous colitis and not bacillus difficilis and some unnamed toxin, okay? Uh, treatment evolves. We've gone the wide gamut of what to do with treatment for C. difficile. And we've actually taken things from the past, things that I don't think we thought we would actually say were acceptable treatments. But now that we have data, we can say that this is actually uh, the right thing to do. Solutions may cause other problems. That goes along with the testing. Research is done on lots of levels, okay? I mentioned a little bit of research that I do. I am not a bench researcher, okay? But I feel like I've had a privilege of being able to contribute to the research community by doing a lot of things that go along with clinical practice. A lot of these things, like these anecdotal case, uh, the anecdotal reports, are also really important what you do. Sometimes when you get into research, you will get thrown into research just because you are the available body to run the study, okay? Sometimes it will be something that you're really interested in, but you start to learn about that one particular thing and it gets a little bit more interesting. And a lot of truth is buried in the literature uh, and a lot of it uh, and how you understand it only really resurfaces uh, when you uh, choose to evaluate, uh, when you choose to validate it. So with that, I'm gonna close. I really appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I wanna thank Dr. Tan for joining us today. And we do have a little bit of time for questions. So I think I see someone approaching the mic. Testing. Okay. Thank you for that talk. It was very interesting and timely for our course. We're covering this topic right now. I was wondering if you could comment a bit on the, the cost of some of these fecal microbiota transplant uh, products that are being sold. And if you could also talk a bit about how you've navigated, forgive my ignorance in this um, area on pharmaceutical research, but navigated maybe some of the conflicts of interest of doing research on certain products and also being a practitioner. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, that, those are two very good questions. Uh, FMT actually has a wide range of, of treatments. Uh, so if you actually look at pre-approval FMTs, the costs that were associated with it were basically the costs associated with the labs that needed to be done to make sure that it was, uh, that there were no communicable diseases and then whatever the endoscopist or the surgeon uh, or the IR person would charge to put in an NG tube or do a colonoscope to bring things in. And that ended up being entirely cash. Um, on the order of anywhere from $500 to $1,500, sometimes more uh, for that single infusion. Um, there is not yet necessarily a set price for RBX2660. 
um, because it has just come to market and the marketing team has just kind of gotten up with it. The thing that you, uh, so once you have approvals, then you start looking at um, costs and coverage from the insurance companies. I will say, I don't know how much offhand, how much it will cost. I will say that if I were to guess, it will be at least in the one to $4,000 range. Okay, that sounds awful again. But again, we have to think of it as the whole thing and whether or not it actually saves, um, saves money and adverse effects in the long term. Now, the second part of your question is a lot is, is difficult too, because as a practitioner um, and doing research or having any sort of relationship with pharmaceutical companies, there is a potential for conflict of interest. Whenever you sign on to do a clinical trial, uh, you do it through a, a research organization that is not that particular company, but you disclose any potential re, uh, relationships you have with a particular with any particular pharmaceutical company. In particular, if you do research for which you have a relationship with a pharmaceutical company, um, you have to mitigate that by uh, trying to figure out who's going to do the consenting, who's going to explain the study, who's going to review all the data uh, so that there can be a more objective viewpoint. A lot of times, if you can't mitigate those things, you shouldn't be doing the study. Um, but you can find colleagues who may not necessarily have that same financial um, relationship where, um, where it, it is a little bit cleaner. Other questions? Um, so the toxins and bacteriophage, uh, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge as to anything going on other than there are still vaccines, uh, toxin-based vaccines in development um, and bacteriophages looked at, but nothing that's actually come, nothing that's gone beyond phase two. I think we're a bit beyond the hour. So if folks need to get to something else, feel free. Dr. Tan may be able to hang out down here for a bit if folks have questions. Uh, one more time for Dr. Watana Kunikorn, Mrs. Watana Kunikorn online. And for Dr. Tan, thank you very much. And thanks for your attendance today.